I'm hoping some of you will remember the story of Pinocchio. He was the wooden puppet that wanted to be a normal boy, and I'm looking for nods now to see if you do. <laughs> Pinocchio always wanted to be something that he wasn't, and he had no friends. So when the fox and the cat came along, they saw him as easy prey. They pretended to be his friend and promised him excitement, fame, fortune, fantasy island, just so they could make money out of him. It was so easy for them to coerce Pinocchio into doing the things he'd never thought of himself, things that he knew were wrong. I think most of us would agree that Pinocchio wasn't a bad lad. He was naive, vulnerable maybe, but he wasn't bad. I'd really like you to hold that thought while I take you on the journey of a real boy who fell into bad company. Let's call him Sam. So, Sam is 12 years old. Picture this boy, full of energy, enthusiasm, impulsive, looking for the next adrenaline rush. He was a whiz on computer games and enjoyed rugby, but he found concentrating and focusing so difficult. At home, he was really protective and loyal about his mum. But when stepdad would come home, things would change and the rules would change. He found that really tough. Sam would say, I hate school, which meant he hated being in trouble. He hated not being successful, not being able to achieve. He really did find writing and concentrating and the classroom so difficult. And he wanted to make mum proud. For him just to see mum coming up to the school would have been amazing. He sounds like quite a few boys I know. After fighting a boy in school who'd said something about his mum, he was excluded. He attended a learning centre where he hoped to achieve. There were fewer expectations and smaller groups. And at first, he was so shocked at how the other boys spoke to the teachers, especially the women teachers. But he quickly became a real wind-up. He was trying to impress the other boys, and he just loved making them laugh. He really wanted friends, and he so wanted them to think he was cool but they never really did. For a few hours a week, Sam had the opportunity to attend our farm, where he loved learning. Animal care, he loved learning to tie knots, bushcraft. He also learned to cook. He was just so keen to learn anything. He engaged with everything we offered, and he conformed to all our expectations to make everybody welcome there. He enjoyed achieving, and he enjoyed the praise. He loved being helpful. He was really part of our team. There was no bravado, no defiance, and this might shock you, but not one single swear word. Sam felt safe in our place. Everybody was just that little bit different. For the first time in his life, Sam was valued for his strength and for his energy and for his willingness to help. Farming met many of his needs. This might have kept him on the straight and narrow, but at the same time, he was struggling more at the learning centre. There were more exclusions, more free time. Boredom set in, and there was time to be exposed to negative influences. With trouble in school, there was more trouble at home, and he really did still hate upsetting his mum. So he's 14 years old now, and the novelty of playing computer games and free time alone at home has really worn off. He'd head off into town where he used to live, he was hoping to see some old faces that might have grown up, even bump into his dad, who wasn't really in his life. Sam was attending our farm regularly now, and he was doing a land-based qualification and writing, happy to write. He'd tell us about what mattered to him, about his wishes. He wanted really simple things. He'd say, all I ever wanted in life was a pet dog. All I've ever wanted is a baby brother. I just want my dad to love me. I just want my mum to be proud of me. He also told us about jobs that he'd want, future jobs. And initially, he wanted to be a policeman, and he'd say what that was going to be like. Then he'd tell us it was a demolition worker and a chef. Just like any 14-year-old boy, he was unsure which direction he would end up in. Then Sam seemed happier for a short time. He was enjoying his freedom and independence. He was hanging out with some friends. They were only a few years older than him. We were made up for him. We were so happy for him. But within 12 weeks, it was really clear something was different. He was telling us he was traveling to London, Cardiff, Manchester, Liverpool. 
He had his first ever sleepovers, not having had friends before, forgetting to tell his mum where he was and when he was coming back. He was reported missing quite often. He started to talk to us about drugs and drill music instead of the drum and bass he'd always listened to. He showed us videos where the language and scenes were extremely violent and threatening. He suddenly knew a lot about drugs, everything about all the current drugs and what was in them and where to get them. He knew his way around the law and he would say, no face, no case. Sam was on a real high a lot of the time. His new friends made him feel special. They gave him gifts, trainers, a phone, took him for burgers. He earned money, 200 pounds a night. He'd say, I'm not doing anything wrong, I'm just exchanging packages. But that wasn't what was important. It was feeling he was trusted. It was feeling he was valued. And it was a feeling that he'd had friends for the first time in his life, something that we couldn't give him. For that, he was so loyal to them, and he believed every single word that they said. <coughs> Sam's whole speech changed to an alienating language, tones and accents we hadn't heard from him before. I'm not sure what you know about emojis, but I had a really steep learning curve. We would send him messages at night to try and interrupt the violence he was exposed to in the evenings. And he would send messages back, often a series of emojis, at times, we really didn't understand what he meant. Interpreting his messages one way, from what he was saying was a lot more sinister. I have to say, the next day, he would tell us exactly what it meant, and now I only ever send a smiley face. Sam said he felt safe. He pre felt protected by his new friends. He felt he owed them for their friendship, and he could not accept that they might be using him. He'd get really cross if we said that he was a victim he would say, they can't make me do anything. He just couldn't go back to the feeling that he had no friends again. That would have been just too painful. They made him so many promises, just like the fox and the cat did Pinocchio. He thought he could be the best at something. They would tell him he was going to be the top of the tree, the gang leader. That to him meant he could raise money to buy his mum a new house. Within six months, his behaviour became chaotic unpredictable, in almost all places, and he was taken into care. He was moved from placement to placement because he said things that were intimidating and confrontational. He would talk about stabbing, cutting, threats. He would punch the walls just for no reason. The messages were coming from his own confusion, fear, and the repetition of the messages from the gangs, backed up by the drill music that he listened to all night long. This instability bound him ever more closer to these young men. The crimes he was associated with became more violent, but he never committed one crime on his own. He would say on the one hand, I owe them, and on the other hand, no one makes me do anything. Sam's 15 years old now. He's attending the farm three times a week. Nobody else would have him. His parallel life was so different. He adhered to all of our expectations. He was helpful, caring of people and, and animals. I could give you hundreds of examples. Just two was he cooked Christmas dinner for 40 men with dementia, and each of those men, men adored him. He helped us with children with autism, and they felt so safe with him because he was bigger for his age. Sometimes he'd just ask us to tell him stories about planets, magic kingdoms, chocolate cars. He just wanted to escape the violent thoughts and images that played over in his mind like a stuck record. You know, he didn't have to keep that path open. He would sometimes travel two hours to get to the farm, only to be challenged when he got there about the actions the night before. But he knew his mentors believed in him, and he trusted us enough to allow himself to be the child that he'd always been. There was no need for any pretense, not even though he was with the gangs a lot of the time. There were some occasions where he just didn't want to do anything. He would just hold his head in his hands and feel suicidal. He'd overdosed twice, and he broke his hand punching a wall, said he didn't even feel it. He would say, I've been bored, born bad. This is me. This is who I am. The gangs had told him he was born bad. He couldn't change. Society and the services also judged him as bad, not just his actions. 
The actions that by now were not his choice at all. Sam really was torn between these parallel worlds. Unsure who he really was anymore, conflicted by the alternate versions of himself. At 16, Sam was way more reflective. He wasn't excited by the gangster lifestyle anymore. He'd calm right down. He could see it for what it really was. But there was no way out. No way out. He was trapped. He became intensely fearful, showing signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. He would talk about bees all over his body if he fell asleep. He'd tell us about horrendous nightmares. So he just didn't sleep. It was easier. He'd look over his shoulder, worried about being stabbed, and he'd often carry a blade when he was out. He always had weapons under his pillow. Sam was never seen as a vulnerable lad, or a victim, not by most people. But he was easy prey because he had a need to be accepted. He had a need for friends. He was pulled and he was coached into believing in violence by the people who wanted to use them for his own gain, for their own gain. Sam did go to prison for a few weeks and he'd been so scared of going. But he sort of seemed pleased to be punished and I don't know if that was just the guilt that he was feeling. But when he knew he was going, he completed a, another piece of written work, his food hygiene certificate, hoping that by cooking for others, he'd be accepted in prison. And when he came out, he was really proud. He'd read something like 10 books. He never read books. And he said, I'm not going back, 100%. I'm never going back. He was so much more positive about his future. But on his release, Sam was placed in a new town, he was alone and he was scared. His so-called friends were waiting for him, telling him who he was needed. He couldn't say no. He had lots more to do daytime that was arranged for him, but the evenings are long when you have nothing to do, you are terrified, you're scared, and there's nobody with you. Sam didn't commit any more offences, but his journey was over within a few weeks. He died in the company of those that said they would protect him. These statistics show that drug-related crime, including knife crime amongst young people, is spreading like a virus. The County Lines model searches for rural recruits, naive young people who want cool friends. Going country, they're calling it at the moment. Gangs are looking currently for clean skins that's not known to police. These young people are victims. They're often being exploited from a very young age and it's all too easy to judge them, just like many did the Rotherham girls. We know the sophisticated salesmen involved in the drugs market constantly adapt their model, model just to protect themselves and so they can make more money. Prevention is clearly better than a cure. Getting out of a ga gang is dangerous and it's difficult. You will have seen associated deaths in the press. So what can we do to make sure young people get the support, the understanding and opportunities they need to live meaningful lives out of reach of this epidemic? I believe there's three main points. One, it sounds so simple. They need somewhere to hang out and talk. Young people who are struggling at home or school need somewhere they can be mentored during the evening that won't cost an arm and a leg. They need somewhere they can express and talk through their fears just so they don't need to carry knives. We, all of us, need to believe in all young people. When traditional schooling fails, we need to provide them with other opportunities to learn and achieve. If we write them off when they're not academic or not coping, we leave them no alternative. If we label them as bad or violent, we play into the hands of those who want them to be exactly that. And three, we've got to be aware, we've got to be alert, and we have to be proactive. As a community, we must not turn a blind eye to drug dealing. We need to be alert to what's happening on street corners, in our parks, and I can tell you, our supermarket car parks. If we spot anything suspicious, we should report it, especially if young people are involved, and that includes teenagers. We also need to be alert to what's known as cuckooing. 
Cuckooing is where vulnerable people's homes are taken over and used for drug business. There is often a lot of violent coercion involved in that. The police cannot protect our young people alone. We all need to be involved in keeping our young people safe. It's our duty. We need to help them develop resilience and the tools they need to resist the lure of the gangs, who, like the fox and the cat, are out to prey on them. I just want to say some good news. I've been a social worker for almost 30 years in Dorset. I've worked with over 2,000 young people, and I have never met a young person who is bad. I have never met a young person who doesn't want to learn. And all of the young people I have met want to be loved and want to feel they belong somewhere. Thank you.